So I'm here with Bob Schuess at Goldfield Ghost Town, and he's kind of the creator of this place. And, and man, I recommend that everybody come and, and check this place out because it's pretty awesome. And, and with that said, Bob, just kind of tell me about you know, how you got this thing going, you're your dream and that, and then tell me some Lost Dutchman stories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how, how, how we got the town going, I had a background of living in a lot of old mining towns in the Mojave Desert, and they were all kind of turning over to tourism. You know, the old ghost towns in the Mojave. I know. And uh, a lot of them have just died away yeah. now. But I knew... You know, I knew about mining. I worked in mining when I was young, before I did construction. And we thought about, you know, it'd be great to uh, bring one of these ghost towns to life. And Goldfield actually sat on this property back in the 18, early 1890s. Uh, not a whole lot of it was left. There was a fire in the 40s. Uh, they were doing some uh, war games out here and the flares caught the brush on fire and burnt down about 60% of the old town. And there was a couple of buildings left on the property when we bought it. Uh, and uh, it, it was two houses and it was a residential five acres. And I bought it with the contingency that we could get commercial zoning on it to do what we wanted to do. And uh, we wanted to put in a mine tour for sure, you know, and, and uh, put up a snack bar and stuff like that. Uh, the zoning people would not give us the zoning for just that. We had to utilize more of the five acres. And they gave us quite a fight. It took about a year and a half to get the zoning approved. We, uh, we did a lot of research on the old town and brought up hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles of what was going on out here in the 1890s. It was amazing because we weren't even a state yet. But this, this economic development that was happening here with the mining just, you know, helped us become a state. Uh, it made, you know, made a lot of jobs for the people, lumber, uh, coal, all kinds of stuff was being used out here. At one point, Goldfield had a bigger population than Phoenix. Really? At the time. Yeah, uh, it, a lot of them had moved out of Phoenix to come out here and look for gold, but you know, for a, for a short period of time, I think Phoenix was 400, and the population here out at Goldfield got to be 500. Uh, same thing happened to Mesa. The guys that, that uh, discovered the gold out here were Mormons from Lehigh. And uh, they had the Black Queen going at the time, which is a mine about a mile up, to, up north. And one guy was out hunting one day, but here's a here's a kicker. They had already bonded the mine to a Colorado mining group, Hall and Sullivan. And so when it when when this guy was out hunting after a, a pretty good flash flood came through and a rainstorm, he found the vein at the mammoth. Huh? And it was a very rich vein. They quit mining at the Queen and came over here and mined at the mammoth. And they dubbed it the Mormon Stope. Was, uh, they found some of the ore in there was running 300 ounces of gold per ton. That's amazing. They produced a 62 pound bar over a one month's run. Oh. Uh, it just was a big boom to the economy and, and we used all that history to support us wanting to get the zoning. You know, it helped us because uh, the, the people at the zoning, they had no idea the history. It was lost, you know. Well, I mean, we had to dig for that history. But there was like four or five different newspapers and there was articles in there every day about what was going on out here. Uh, every time somebody made a trip from Mesa to the to this area, they called it the gold fields. It was, in the, the original mining claims, were filed in the Superstition Mining District. And that's very important to know. Uh, you want to talk about the Dutchman later on, we'll do that. But that's very important that the gold fields were part of the superstitions at that time. The name didn't get changed until they put the Apache Trail in 
and all those newspaper articles that talked about everything that was going on here, the first thing they said is, so-and-so is going out to the gold fields to check his mine today. So-and-so bought a brand new mill. So-and-so is hauled timber. So-and-so is put in a new boiler. I mean, everything. A lot of activity. Every day for, oh. for months, years actually, from, from 1890, I'm gonna say 18, they first found the first gold out here in, in 82, uh, 82, 83, and actually filed claims, but nobody would come out here and work because the Apaches were still running around. Then in 1887, that was the big truce, you know, or the treaty, and uh, there was still a few bands running around that hadn't, you know, signed up all the way, you know. So nobody wanted to come out here and work the mines. So it wasn't until 1892 when they started working the Queen. And shortly after that, they sold their interest, the four Mormons, sold for $20,000. They got $5,000 a piece. And then Hall and Sullivan came in and just uh, produced over a million and a half dollars worth of gold. You gotta remember, gold was 20 bucks an ounce at that time. So you imagine what it would be worth yeah. today? Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, but getting back to, to the story about the Dutchman and stuff, well, let me stick with the, my, the, the town. Uh, we, we had to show that we were gonna put some more businesses in. We had to show that we had enough parking to start and all that. And uh, we finally got the zoning. And as we started doing our thing, more and more people kind of fell in love with the place and the idea and they wanted businesses here. Cool. And they actually put the money up to build their buildings. And we allowed them to come in and do that. Uh, and we bought the buildings back from them out of their rent. And that's how the place started getting built. A whole lot of labor and effort. It was just uh, the materials that we paid for, the labor, a lot of it was done jointly. Cool. Now the Dutchman, I've looked high and low for that Dutchman when I first got here in the 70s, made many, many trips out into the superstitions then. Uh, there isn't too much gold out there at all. There's a couple of little low grade veins in uh, uh, first water area, uh, maybe quarter of an ounce per ton and there's there's no depth to them they're very shallow no no depth to where you're gonna get any any vein out of it uh, the gold that was in the superstitions was here at Goldfield the most likely mine that was found and mined out nine months after the Dutchman died I mean, they, find, they, they, they mined it. They started mining it nine months after the Dutchman died. It was all mined out in a year and a half. A million bucks was the bulldog. Uh, it fit all the clues that he left to Julia Thomas and Reinhardt Petrae. All the clues. It was in a north-south canyon on a small hill. You could see the, we the tip of Weaver's Needle from the hill behind the mine. There's a funny shaped peak near the mine, which is Bulldog Peak, which the mine was named after. Uh, the military trail, it comes through the Goldfield Mountains, over there, right where the, just north of the Bulldog. And you could see the trail from the mine, but you couldn't see the mine from the trail. It fits all the clue. The biggest clue that it fits was if you read a geology report from the Bulldog Mine, it is identical to what the Dutchman said he had. The 18 inch wide vein, a 400 foot strike along the ground of quartz. And when you got that guy saying that, describing his vein, and you got a geologist describing it exactly the same way. What are the odds of that in the same vicinity? Yep. Yep. Right? Yep. Had to have been the bulldog. 
And the bulldog was where? Just west of us here. Okay. Between the, the ridge of the mountains to the west, the, the, what, what are called the gold fields today. Back in the original time when the Dutchmen first discovered that, they were called the Salt River Mountains, all of them. Superstitions and gold fields. Salt River Mountains. That's 1860, right after the Gadsden Purchase. They didn't want to use the Spanish names, which the superstitions were Sierra del... del help me out, Sal. The foam. Como se dice? Espuma, espuma. Sierra de espuma. That's uh, the water line from the Indian story of the flood. So that was used, but also La Montaña de Superstición. Okay, they used that name. And after the Gadsden Purchase, the, the, before that was the Peralta land grant fraud, they didn't want to admit that there was any Spaniards north of the Gila River after the Gadsden uh, purchase because they didn't have to want to they didn't want to uh, honor those grants okay but there's one thing that's really funny up up near Prescott there's a the Baca float land grant that went through <laughs> yeah anyway yeah a lot of lot of history a lot of lot of stuff but uh, that's pretty much I, I, I'd put all my money on the, on the bulldog. But there's people that don't want to believe that. Yeah. Uh, there's one other clue that he gave. He said he was telling them if they, if they passed the three red hills, they went too far. Right? To Julia Thomas. The three red hills were right here at Goldfield. Oh, really? The hill we're on was red before it's been disturbed. The hill over there where the horses are that you see over there, uh -huh. that was one of the three red hills. They've mined 20 feet of granite off that property. Whoa. It's no longer red. Uh -huh. The other red hills right across the street. Okay. That's the three red hills. If you went past the three red hills, you've gone too far. And don't ask me why people take the tip of Weaver's Needle and turn it into going right to the base of Weaver's Needle to look for the mine. <laughs> I'll never figure that one out. Well, Bob, man, I thank you for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad to be a help. And thanks for building this for people to come and enjoy. Well, that was my... I'll tell you one more story. You know, you, you do things, you work your ass off, and you do things and you want to know if you did the right thing or not. And I'm going to tell you about a little kid at the gold panning and I was walking by one day and he was panning for gold and he had a few flakes in his pan and I stopped and said what do you got there bud and he shows me and his eyes were this big and that's when I knew I did the right thing same thing happened to me when I was a kid at Knott's Berry Farm